tour. We'll do a tour of the telescopes again. And we'll talk about the weather situation in just a moment. But just out of curiosity, how many of you have been here to the observatory? This is your first time, first time, first time here. Okay. Wow, I thought there was a lot of people, right? That was the first time I could tell. Um, so we, we hopefully, if you didn't catch our tour, we'll do it again after the program. Just want to tell you about our website, Copernic.org. We got a lot of neat things on the website when there's a, a clear sky alert going on. We're, we're kind of optimistic it's going to clear. We'll talk about that in a second. But I don't know, it might be something called hopium. But uh, we're, we're hoping it to, to clear. Uh, the reason why we kind of think that is there's something called the clear sky clock right here. You click on that, and it's kind of predicting. For short-term forecasts, we rely on this quite a bit. So sometimes it lies. But anyway, so what you got here, cloud cover. Dark blue is good. White is bad. All right, so that's where we are right now. And uh, you got transparency, which is how much water vapor is in the air. And then you got seeing, which is how steady the air is. But we got at around 9 o'clock, they're saying, you know, dark blue here. So there's a shot at it. Hopefully it kind of rains and then it clears. So if you looked at the forecast earlier today, it was kind of, it was saying everything. You know, rain and clear, you know. So, so did anybody see that rainbow on the way here? Yeah, you saw it? Okay, great. Okay, so anyway. All right, so check out our website, Copernic.org. We still have summer camps going on. And you can find out, click right here for our summer camps. We've still got a few more running in, into, into August, so check that out. If you want to help the observatory, if you shop on Amazon, you can go to amazonsmile.amazon.com, and they give, you, they give us a donation, so, and it doesn't cost you anything. So the only thing is it's, you know, I get online sometimes and buy from Amazon, and then you got to make sure you're on that one link, that's smile.amazon. Dot com. Sometimes you go, it defaults back to regular Amazon, so you're not giving. But anyway, just if you're interested in doing that, that does help the observatory. If we can get a lot of people signed up for that, uh, you know, just a few purchases from everybody will go a long way here. So, um, and just recently we got a Flickr account, so you can check out our images. All right, but we also have a YouTube channel that you can go to, and you press here for YouTube. Check out our videos tonight. We're, we're going to be live streaming. We're live streaming right now. And um, a few, when was that eclipse? It was a few months ago. Was it like six months ago? When was that? May 15th. So on May 15th, we had a lunar eclipse here. And it was incredible. So this, this, this view right here has over half a million views. And so we've been messing around with YouTube for years you know, going back way back, and we, we've only had, you know, slowly we're adding subscribers. It wasn't, we were up to maybe like 1,800, and that night we got 8,000 subscribers, you know, in, in just a few hours, and Jeremy pulled that off, and it was a live lunar eclipse, and that was fantastic, so I recommend you checking that out, but um, anyway, so just, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and all right. And that's pretty much it. So I'd like to just introduce uh, Robert. He's going to do a little program here about um, dwarf planets here. And go ahead and get your so I can yeah. So Robert Olaf Seegers uh, has been involved with the observatory for a good 15 years or so. He also worked at Roberson, and uh, he's also a local musician. Okay, are you going to make the? Uh, there's a festival going on right in Trumansburg. Yeah. And <laughs> I won't make. So anyway. Um, so Robert used to come up and see a lot of the programs I used to do, and that's, that's how I met him. But he's a real good expert here on, on the solar system, and particularly about dwarf planets. Because you know, uh, a, a few years ago, we, we uh, astronomers came up, finally came up with the definition of a planet. And so I'm sure you're going to talk about that, right? A yes. little bit? Okay. And uh, so anyway, uh, without any further ado, here's Robert. He'll, he'll give you a, a tour of the solar system and particularly the dwarf planets. Okay, gosh, you All right, you good? I think so. Is he, can you just, is he good? He's, he's All good. righty. Thanks, everybody. I'm Robert Olaf Seegers, and just in general, it's a great time to be exploring the solar system. There have been so many robotic spacecraft missions that have gone to pretty much all the planets. Uh, and and uh, the moons around these planets, where we're actually finding possibilities for life, and I think that's, that's really exciting, and we continue to look for for those. Um, but what we're going to look at tonight are uh, dwarf planets, and what that is. Back in 2006, Pluto 
unfortunately, at the tail end of a meeting that I guess half the people at least were gone from, they voted. <laughs> they voted that Pluto be demoted. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about why that happened and so forth. So Pluto ended up being called a dwarf planet. That, that term was coined shortly after that meeting. And, and actually, but the important thing is there's more things out there, and that's what's fun. So you know what? Who cares what they're called? The point is there's a lot of planet toys out there, and our solar system is getting bigger and bigger with members. And that's, that's the fun part. So. So just kind of what we'll talk about here in a nutshell, what I'll present is the prehistory of dwarf planets uh, from 1801 to 1930, the advent of the dwarf planet, <laughs> what is a dwarf planet, who and where are the dwarf planets, and finally, have a heart for Pluto because Pluto has a heart for you. <laughs> so we'll, get, we'll see what that means here at the, at the end. And um, actually, this all started back in, believe it or not, in 1801, okay? Um, We've, uh, a couple of European uh, astronomers uh, back in 1801 through 1809 found some of the larger members of what is known today as the asteroid belt. And uh, they actually listed them as planets, and then they realized they were quite small, and they eventually would just be called minor planets and so forth, and then eventually the asteroid belt. You're looking at um, four of the larger ones, uh, Ceres being the largest, which we'll look at soon. And the asteroid belt lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And the funny thing about that, if you, lo if you look at that, you guys see all the circles around the sun there? And those are the planets, right? What, where, if there was another planet, where do you think it would be? When you see uh, Mars's orbit and you see Jupiter's orbit, right? Doesn't it look like there should be a planet where the asteroid belt is? Yeah, and there's a theory that maybe there was one, maybe uh, Jupiter's gravity, gravity prevented it from forming, but there's actually a whole lot of excitement in that asteroid belt. And uh, that diagram I just showed you, uh, it kind of has a mathematical um, uh, history between, between the two. Uh, this Titus Bode law, which was uh, from the 18th century, actually predicted. They used a mathematical formula to predict where planets should be. And you can see there should be one at 2.8 astronomical units. Now, that's a big term, and we're gonna, I'm going to tell you what an astronomical unit is in just one moment. Right, I guess now. <laughs> so, so an astronomical unit is uh, basically the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the average distance, and that's 93 million miles. Because that's a lot, the, we, these numbers get very, very big as you go through the solar system. And it's a lot easier to handle a, a unit, like an astronomical unit than you know, millions and billions and so forth. Of course, when we go beyond our solar system, we use the term light year to describe like, where the stars are and so forth. So, so um, Neptune is discovered in 1846. This is actually really important because it was actually predicted uh, mathematically where it would be. And Neptune has a lot to do with what goes on uh, in the outer part of our solar system, beyond, beyond it. So what happened was um, when they discovered Neptune, they noticed that there were still some s strange things going on with its orbit, like things were pulling out. They used the word perturbation. But what it they, so they assumed there was a bigger planet beyond Neptune that was doing that. And that led to a big search. And that is in 1930. Um, Clyde Tomba actually, after a series of nights, noticed, as you can see here, this guy going across, that is in our solar system. Everything else here are stars. They're trillions and trillions of miles away. They never move in our lifetime. But these, this guy right here, was uh, after a succession of a number of nights, they realized that that was, in fact, in our solar system. So that became Pluto. Okay. And first they thought Pluto had to be really, really big. But they realized after, you know, more sophisticated uh, measurements, they realized that Pluto you know, was quite small. And you can see basically what it would look like next to the Earth. So, <laughs> so Pluto is actually um, kind of interesting the way it actually goes around the sun. Its orbit has a couple of interesting things, okay? For one, it briefly 
uh, lies within Neptune's orbit. It doesn't ever come close to Neptune, but it does get closer to the Sun, uh, Neptune, for a short time in its orbit. It's also tipped six, uh, 17 degrees from the plane. Like if you take the, if the, pla if the solar system was on a dish with the Sun and the planets, as you can see, Pluto is tipped. It's the red one you see there, 17 degrees. So that's different compared to the other ones. Um, and um, and, and then on its own, yeah, it's also got a moon, I'm sorry, that's actually very, very close. But we'll get that back to that later. So um, here's what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> In fast motion here. And if you look at it from above or below, it would kind of like something like this little spider's web kind of image there. <laughs> and you can see it's what they call elliptical. It's not as, none of, the, none of the planet's orbits are circular, but Pluto's is more elliptical than the others. So there, there are a lot of terms, and when we read about this, it's like, like what does that mean again? So, so I just envision if you're, if you're on a trip, you maybe you're going to go on a summer vacation or something, and your luggage tag has one of these things here, you could be in trouble because TNO stands for Trans-Neptunian Object. That means uh, object around or beyond Neptune. KBO is a Kuiper Belt Object. That's a belt of um, kind of like the asteroid belt, except more like ice uh, beyond Neptune. And a scattered disk object, which is beyond that, and then finally the the uh, theorized Oort cloud, which is like at the edge of the solar system where we think the comets come from. So forth. So, so, so actually, in 2006, what Roy was alluding to, there was rules that made that define what a dwarf planet was. A celestial body that orbits the sun and it is not a moon has enough mass to assume a nearly spherical shape, what they call the hydrostatic equilibrium, and it lacks the gravitational forces needed to attract and accumulate all the material in its orbit. And that's one of the the big ones there, why Pluto is not considered a planet, it's a regular planet. So we're going to jump ahead just a little bit at the asteroid belt. Uh, the Dawn mission actually arrived at the asteroid belt in 2011 and uh, took a close look at two of the asteroids, uh, Vesta and Ceres. And Ceres, well, we'll go, we'll go to that because that is actually considered a dwarf planet. And um, you can see the basic timetable here when it when it took off, when it arrived, and so forth. And finally, we have some close-ups here of Ceres. And it's, it's a lot smaller than our moon. It's only 588 miles across. There's a um, closer look at its surface. And uh, the average temperature is actually fairly warm for where it is. Um, um, there is like water vapor and so forth. There's other, and there's like liquid, uh, there's clay and stuff like that just below the surface. So there, there is definitely things happening uh, on this uh, dwarf planet. So it's a little warmer than you'd expect because we've all, I'm sure we've all experienced minus 36 at least one time. That's right. And it's got, a, like you see, a thin water va vapor atmosphere. Um, there was a mysterious white spot they noticed on Ceres, and there was a lot of speculation to what that might be. And they figured out it was sodium carbonate, which is actually, I guess, the main ingredient in laundry detergent. So if we do set up a space station on Ceres, at least we'll have a, la a laundry detergent to have there for the astronauts. But very important, Ceres, they believe, is 25% water. Um, it's like there's an ocean, they believe. I'm pretty sure. And that's impressive because if that's the case, there's more water on Ceres than there is on Earth. And you saw how small Ceres is compared to Earth. And I think when we look at places that might possibly harbor life, you know, Ceres is a really good candidate. And it's, certainly, it's actually one of the closer places. Uh, actually, the next stop beyond Mars, actually. So, um, so maybe they're, they're talking about other missions and so forth. But there's a lot of things you know, active on the surface here and below. And Ceres makes up, a, you know, a quarter of the mass of the asteroid belt. So when you think about, could this be a planet? You know, you, you know what, you, it's definitely possible. Maybe, maybe this is what kind of was the main part of this, and maybe it blew up. There's, there's a lot of um, disagreement with that. But anyway, Ceres does happen to be where another planet 
should be. And you can see Sirius compared to our moon. It's pretty small. Huh? Our moon, by the way, is one of the seven giant moons in the solar system. So Jupiter has four, Saturn has one, Neptune has one, and we have one. So, so I mentioned the Kuiper Belt, and that's, uh, there isn't a sign out there. <laughs> this is welcome to the Kuiper Belt. But you know, it's, a, it's a bunch of icy uh, objects that orbit the sun, and some of them are pretty big, like Pluto. So Pluto is considered a Kuiper Belt object. And things started heating up for like, maybe Pluto shouldn't be like considered a regular planet. Back in, two, they were already finding like these small, you know, things out there. But they finally found in 2002, uh, one called Quoror, which is maybe half the size of Pluto. Pluto has, um, Quoror has a moon called Weywat. So that is, I believe, a Native American um, mythology. And in 2004, they actually um, found another one. And this one's really important, and you're going to see why in a moment. It's called Orcus. Okay. And Orcus um, basically kind of orbits the sun similarly to what Pluto does. In fact, you take almost the... I'm not going to say exactly, but nearly exactly, the same amount of time to go around the sun. They're the, basically the same distance from the sun, very close. And we'll take a closer look at a chart at that later on. Also tipped, not in the same way, but also tipped from the uh, plane of the solar system. Um, in 2005, they, they found one they now named Maki Maki. The, uh, the usual names are, the original names are like numbers and, and letters and so forth. But... Um, but one thing, too, now, um, you know, it's very difficult to show people little dots <laughs> all the time. So that's where we get to use art. And it's really fun. We use art, artists' impressions of what the planet might look like. And then what they do is they get information. So they know, like, Maki Maki is a red planet, okay? So they know that. And they know, like, how this, what the sun might look like from there and so forth. So a lot of thought goes behind these, um, what, you know, imagine, imaginative uh, drawings. Um, in 2005, also, there was uh, discovered Haumea. And Haumea is, is unique, too. You see, can you see the two moons? Okay. And you see just kind of a, a blur of light. That's because these things are so far away, they basically flood the image with light just so you can see something out there. But Haumea is actually very unique because it's shaped like an egg. And there's a reason for that. The, um, the North Pole and the South Pole are, you know, either one is over here and there. The equator is the really wide part. It spins so fast, it orbits, it uh, goes around on its axis every four hours. It's like one of the fastest spinning objects in our solar system. And what happens is it becomes very, the word is oblate, where it just kind of pancakes rather than being uh, spherical. Um, and the, again, this is, a, of course, an uh, artist's drawings with the two moons and the planet might look like. It's, it's fairly reflective, so it's mostly all ice. Uh, also, they recently found in 2017 a ring around this dwarf planet. So um, that's pretty exciting. It's the only one we know of that, ha that has one of, of, of the dwarf planets. Pretty cool. Also, I should say, uh, almost every one of these planets was discovered by a guy by the name of Michael Brown from California Tech and, and various others with him. Haumea is actually one that's actually contested. He's one of the people, but also an observatory in Spain, the Sierra Nevada Observatory, they actually found it around the same time. So there's actually controversy who should get credit for finding Haumea. And Haumea, I believe, is, um, is a Polynesian like um, goddess of like fertility and childbirth. So they, they have to agree on like a, a particular theme to go with when they name these. So another one that was uh, in 2007 was one that you can see the, the image, which it's hard to make sense of that, but it's called Gong Gong, and it's got a moon called Xing Liu, and that's uh, from Chinese mythology. And finally, this one was actually discovered a little bit before, but I kind of saved the two uh, really important ones, maybe for last, or two most significant ones. This was the one that I think kind of really hit Pluto on the head <laughs> when they found 
Eris. He discovered Eris because Eris is just a, it's about the same size as Pluto. And at first, it's like, oh, let's make Eris the tenth planet. And then they said, well, wait, <laughs> we're finding all these other objects that are like Pluto. Maybe Pluto and friends shouldn't be con considered planets. So that's where all this controversy started. But it, this was a big, uh, big deal. And you can see again the same thing we saw with Pluto. Uh, it's a series of photographs. You can see this thing here moving in front of the stars, which are never move. They're like our backdrop from, from our perspective. Um, so Eris actually has a moon. Uh, it's called dysnomia. And if you forget that what that is later on, that is dysnomia. It's when you forget something. I guess. <laughs> forget the name of something. And uh, Eris, I guess, is uh, kind of like the was like sort of a Greek, ancient Greek deity that would like cause problems, like kind of like a Pandora's box type of thing. So, um, and it did. I guess it caused a lot of problems for Pluto, which may be why they perhaps picked that name. I'm not sure. Originally, he wanted to call it Xena because the guy that discovered it, Michael Brown, wanted to name it after his favorite TV show character. I guess so. Back in the day, but they they agreed on Eris. Um, looking at some of the orbits here, you can see. Um, you can see, like, here is uh, Pluto. You can see it compared to Neptune and so forth. You can see much how far they're out. So both Eris and um, Gong Gong are actually beyond the Kuiper Belt. They're just, just beyond it. They call that the scattered disk. That's the name they use for that. So it's just beyond. And then in 2004, astronomers, um, they found, uh, Michael Brown, that is, found Sedna. And Sedna was a really important discovery because it was the farthest known object at the time. It's really, really far out there. Its diameter, they're not even sure. It's, it's still pretty, it's near its closest point to the sun, which it'll be coming up on. But it takes about 11,000 years to orbit the sun. So, so it, it takes a long time. So it's really far away. It's, it's estimated to be about 1,000 miles across. Um, and uh, it's going to be in its closest point to the sun around 2075 or 2076. They're actually looking maybe to get a mission, believe it or not, to launch it in like the 2030s, maybe to arrive at to, to Sedna when it's there, to its closest point, and maybe um, maybe uh, people beyond us will get to get to see see <laughs> the pictures, I guess. But anyway. Um, very cold. They say it never gets above minus 400 there. Wow. And you can see the orbit of Sedna. It really shows you. This is Pluto. The, see the purple one here? Look at Sedna. And then here's where it is about now. All right? But look how far it can get. So, okay, so like 5,000 years from now, it'll be here, basically. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't see it. There could be other objects like that that are just, you know, right now so far away. Now, this is also really important because they found other ones now like Sedna. They call them Sednoids. Um, so there's a bunch more. And they all seem to kind of do the same thing, uh, the way they orbit. And it's like something else is pulling them beyond. And that has led to speculation for maybe there's a giant planet on the edge of our solar system, like larger than Neptune, that could be doing this. And we just haven't found it yet. So the search is on. They're looking for this. And of course, now we have the James Webb Telescope. So I'm not sure if they're going to get that involved or not. But um, that can see really far and really clear. So we'll, we'll see what they do with that. But there might be a planet out there. So going back to Pluto here, um, the, the, there was a spacecraft that arrived there in 20, uh, 2015. But before that, the best pictures we had were from the Hubble telescope. And the Hubble telescope, you can see like it's really far. It's great because it's out there in space. But you notice it's still not very detailed. But you did see coloring there. So we knew there was something kind of unusual about Pluto that maybe wasn't expected. And also, the Hubble took uh, some pictures there. And you can see they found that Pluto had uh, a number of moons. And here is a, here is a 
kind of an idea of what the moons look like uh, going around Pluto. And they all have to do with the, I guess it's the Roman god of the underworld. And I think the Styx is the river uh, that goes there. And I think Chiron is like the ferryman, whatever. And there's, of course, the Hydra is, and Kiberos are like, um, you know, creatures and, and so forth. But anyway, uh, so they, they stick with the mythology of, of the planet. So the New Horizons mission uh, takes off, I think it was around 2007 or six, and it arrived at Pluto in 2015, and it, it, didn't, do, it didn't do a uh, orbit, it just actually it was a flyby. So, you know, if, if somebody was sleeping <laughs> or, uh, or they were on strike or something, it could have been a, could have been a disaster. So it, it only takes an X amount of minutes to get, f to get across, as you can see the timeline on there. But um, it actually did see things both arriving and departing from Pluto. And one of them is this cool thing. This is Pluto, the bigger one here. And this other one out on the outside is Charon. And that's its large moon. It's about half the size of Pluto. Something interesting, though, when you look at Pl Pluto, it looks like it's going around another point, doesn't it? And what's happening is a point outside of Pluto's body that both Pluto and Charon actually orbit. So in a way, it's like a binary planet. That's the term they would use. Now, it's a little bit similar to Earth. Now, with Earth, the, we have our moon, which is pretty large compared to our size. But the point where the Earth and the moon go around is actually within the Earth's <coughs> body. So we don't look like we're wobbling like that from, from space. And finally, here's the, the picture <laughs> that is, uh, we thought it was a hoax. We were here for an event called Pluto Palooza. And I, was, I had to get a PowerPoint ready for this event. And when the first pictures arrived, the it was the first one is actually of the one with the heart. It wasn't in color. It was uh, in black and white, or grayscale, rather. Um, but one of my coworkers said, don't put it on. It's a hoax. Because <laughs> he thought it was like a, a gag. So we kind of we, you know, made sure it was the real, real deal. But there's really a heart-shaped feature on Pluto. And Pluto is amazing because as far away as it is, like over three point whatever billion miles away, and as cold as it would be, there's still stuff going on uh, you know, just below the surface. And it actually has an atmosphere. And, um, and there's just like a nitrogen atmosphere. And, but, it, but there's processes that actually happen. And like ice flows, um, like uh, geysers, volcanoes, that sort of thing. And that's because these temperatures of these other elements, other, other compounds, the freezing point's so low that just a little bit of sunlight actually makes things happen. Now, Pluto's atmosphere, um, it's only up over Pluto when Pluto's at its closest points to the sun. Once it gets far away, and this just recently happened, the atmosphere collapses onto the surface and creates like a, creates a frost. So, um, so it won't come back up again until, um, once again, Pluto gets to a, um, to a uh, closer point to the sun, which I think its orbit's the, uh, 248 years. So it'll be a while. So. But here we get some close-ups from New Horizons. Craters. Again, and the terrain is just like nothing you would expect. You know, you would expect like a, just a ton of craters or whatever, but things happen, and they fill in those craters and, and form these like interesting landscapes. Okay, again, one of the more plain areas. This is part of the heart, actually. Platinum, Sputnik, or something like that. You can never pronounce it. Okay, this is just. This looks like it could be somebody's like, you know, patio or something outside. It just, it's just an, an amazing view. Where we're 
looking at is in the heart itself. And these uh, images are all available. Just go to NASA and New, or New Horizons, that's the name of the mission, and you'll find all these images. It's fascinating. There's just, there's like thousands of them. And there actually is, in the atmosphere, like it says, there was actually a sky over, over Pluto. It's actually, believe it or not, is blue. <laughs> so. So it'd be a great night if there was an observatory on Pluto. Probably it would be no problem seeing anything right out there. So here's Pluto's uh, giant moon or big moon, Charon. It's like I said, half the size of Pluto, almost exactly. And even the Plu and even this moon, it's got some interesting cracks in it, but not a ton of craters. And again, when we don't see when we see a smoother surface like that, it means it's a very very young s surface. You know, meaning like millions of years or whatever. But still, that's, that's young. Um, now, these are not near each other, but these are two of the smaller moons that were discovered um, actually by the, by the Hubble telescope. Uh, but New Horizons got a better view of them, so you can kind of see what they look like. And two other ones that were even farther away, Cabarrus and Styx. Very small. Charon's the only large one. So just some interesting facts about Pluto. Um, anyway, this gravity, of course, is 1 15th of the Earth's. Its surface temperature is between minus 396 and 360 Fahrenheit. Its diameter is um, 1,477 miles. And its moon, or partner, binary partner there, um, um, is Chiron, is 753 miles. And you can see the atmosphere, nitrogen, carbon, monoxide, methane, and water ice. Average distance from the sun is 39 um, and a half astronomical units, but you would times that by, you know, 93 million <laughs> to figure out what the actual distance is in miles. Okay, so that's why we use um, use that AU. So um, the minimum distance is 29.7 AU, and the uh, maximum was like I said, 49. So its average is about 39. So that's quite a quite a var variation. So here I've got listed uh, what they pretty much agreed on, the nine dwarf planets in our, in our um, solar system. And you can see closest to the sun is Ceres. Ceres is in the asteroid belt. Um, we should say that there are a couple other candidates in the uh, asteroid belt that are being considered as dwar possible dwarf, candidate, um, uh, dwarf planet candidates. Um, one of them is Vesta which is the second largest one, and the other one called Hygieia, which is the fourth largest one, I believe. So both of them are, have a lot of characteristics that might that seem to e equate to uh, being a dwarf planet. Of course, Pluto and Orcus, which you notice they are about the same distance apart. I mean, I'm sure it's the same distance from the sun. You guys see that? So that's, they have a lot in common. That's why I said it was a really important discovery. Now, there's the types. The, the, you see Kuiper Belt, Plutino, uh, and so forth. They add even more words to make it more difficult <laughs> to classify these things. But a Plutino is basically one of these Kuiper Belt objects that actually goes around the sun twice for every three times that Neptune does. See, Neptune basically has a lot of control over these other objects out there. And that's, like I said, that was one of the reasons why they had to reconsider Pluto's status, because Neptune has a lot to do with Pluto's orbit, as well as other objects like Orcus, for example. Um, so it's called a resonance, uh, a 3-2 resonance, where Neptune goes three times and Pluto twice around the sun um, in the same time period. Um, also, there's another one called Haumea, which we saw, the egg-shaped one. That is a, considered a Kuiper Belt object, but it's kind of unique. It's got a quirk. It is got a 12-7 resonance with Neptune. So in other words, for every 12 times Neptune goes around the sun, Haumea goes around seven times. So that's a little bit unusual. And then the ones we saw a little farther out, um, actually we have uh, Quarar and um, Maki Maki. They are what they call Kuiper Belt Cubanos, and what they are and I'm not sure how they came up with this word, <laughs> but the Cubanos are basically 
they don't they're not dependent on Neptune. They are they have their own independent orbit around the sun. So that makes them different than Pluto and Orcus and Haumea. So moving beyond the Kuiper belt now, we have um, Gong Gong and Eris, and they are what we call the scattered disk. That's that's away from the Kuiper belt. Um, and then you can see it's farther. And interestingly enough, when you look at both Gong Gong and Eris, um, their distance from the sun, average distance from the sun, is about the same. So that's kind of kind of cool. And then finally, we have Sedna, which is the one that's way out. They call that detached. They think it goes closer to what the theorized Oort cloud at the edge of our solar system. Uh, and it's just like I say, it takes 11,000 years to go around the sun, and it's and it's. At its closest, it's 84 AU. At its farthest, it's over 900 astronomical units away. So it's, um, it's quite, quite a ways away out there. So. And the Oort cloud, like I say, you can't, if you put a map of our solar system up there, you can't, you can't do it because the distances are so, so incredible, the distances from each other. So you have to kind of use exponents. And that's what you see here in this, in this um, in this diagram, you have like Saturn, for example, is uh, 10 to the first uh, away from, from Earth and so forth. So you can see how far away the Oort cloud is. It, it's, that's amazing. So, and that's where we believe a lot of our comets and maybe other things come, come from there. So, All right, so that's all I had to, to show you. I, I hope that was enough. That was probably a lot to remember. But any questions at all about some of these objects? A supernova? That's a star that explodes and it's just absolutely gigantic and leaves a big cloud of, of, um, of like gas and, and dust and so forth. And they're very, usually very colorful because of the different gases that are in them. So it's usually like when a big, big star does that. Question back there? I think I, when the sun, supposedly when the sun runs out of gas, it's supposed to, I guess, become more like a dwarf. It's supposed to, it's not going to be like a big, they, they claim, it's not going to be like a big explosion. Like if, if Betelgeuse or Rigel or one of those blew up, it, you know, potentially could be a black hole because they're so massive. But, um, but our sun is actually relatively, you know, kind of a medium, regular kind of star. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so they think it won't be anything spectacular. It'll turn, it'll turn color because what happens is when these stars run out of their um, uh, hydrogen and then helium, they start burning iron, and that's why they get their red, reddish color. That's why Betelgeuse is near the end of its life cycle because it's red, and it's red. It's pretty amazing. So I like your, I like your uniform, by the way. It's awesome. Yeah. Any other questions about the dwarf planets at all here? Which one, where's that? Yeah, not either, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure that we did. Huh. Yeah. Well, we, we could find out right now. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I know they found more of the objects like Sedna out there, but let's see. That's kind of interesting. I didn't. Okay, so Ross 248. It's a star, actually. Yeah. It's, oh, it's a star. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Closer than Proxima Centauri. I guess. Ten, well, no, because it's ten point three light years from Earth. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I guess they must be squeezing in some more exponents in there on us. I guess. Yeah, I'd never. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions at all on the back there? Oh, Jupiter's, yes. Um, yeah. Let's see if we can get back to that. Way in the beginning, right? In the asteroid belt one. Oops. Here we go. 
yeah, the Trojan asteroids, they actually share Jupiter's orbit around the sun. So uh, they're obviously traveling at such a speed where they can maintain their, their distance from Jupiter and the sun. I'm, I'm guessing it's a, it's a little similar to what, how the James Webb telescope is probably kind of like in its, its orbit. It's at a point where the sun and the Earth's orbits kind of cancel each other out, if that, right? So it sounds about right. So, um, so these are just asteroids that actually share the orbit with, with Jupiter. All right. Any other questions at all? Back there? Um, just recently, there was supposed to be a major alignment of the planets. Um, all the planets were supposed to be aligned. Hmm. Did you guys witness that? Um, we did. Well, we, well, with our school groups here in the, in the, in the morning, I know we, um, like Jeremy and I, and we, we, we would actually show them on Stellarium. That was the program that we used in the computer lab. We would have them like pretend they woke up at five o'clock in the morning or four thirty, and you could see like on like Mercury, um, you could see Mercury, Venus, um, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were all in there too. And I guess Uranus wasn't too far away either, but you can, again, you, it's hard to see that one without a. Yeah, yeah. I I'm not sure. Um, anybody else know about the, as far as the effects of that? You know, I know there's always, it's always a big deal, I know, and I know certainly astrologically it is, it is a big deal when planets align, but, um, you know, I think uh, if, uh, you know, I th those outer planets, of course, do have a lot of gravity, like Jupiter and Saturn, and, you know, there's always, like, I wonder what that, what that could happen. That happen very often, I don't think it does very often. I know there was a big alignment, I think, in 1999 or something, there was one where they were, where they were all, including Pluto, I think, even, but... Um, yeah, but it's definitely fun stuff, you know, that's for sure. So, <laughs> anything else, question-wise? No? Peter has a question. Sure. Uh, so, Mark Bowen <coughs> asks, uh, do dwarf planets have magnetic poles, and if so, do they flip like Earth's every few hundred uh, thousand years? Hmm. Let's see. I would have to, I have to look, check that one out. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, you know. Mm -hmm. so. That's all right. Uh, then, let's see, uh, Mike Blake. We know Mike Blake. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any evidence or, uh, of uh, Kuiper and or Oort belt groupings on other star systems? Hmm. You know, I know we're always talking about, like, uh, the habitable zones of these other star systems. I, you know, I, I imagine the, maybe with James Webb, maybe they'll we'll be taking a closer look at that. Mm -hmm. That's actually really interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. Maybe we will see some, some data from that coming soon. Yeah, it's really interesting because I remember like uh, one of the arguments uh, for P P Pluto being like classified was like if you were coming from another solar system and you saw these eight planets that were kind of going around more circular and all of a sudden you saw these other ones, what would you think? But maybe that's actually more common than we think, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that's actually a, gr a great, uh, yeah, it's question. a great question. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those discoveries that's really maybe yet to happen. Yeah. Um, then, uh, Randy asks, uh, what is the estimate of dwarves that may be too far out to see? So I guess the, the, those that dwarf planets and even maybe planets that are too far out. Yeah. Um, well, like, you know, they, they have found, you know, more beyond, you know, Sedna. So there's one of the ones, beyond, uh, the Sednoids, they call them, is actually farther than Sedna. So um, I'm, I'm guessing, again, with James Webb, that's going to, that, that's going to, that distance will increase. I think we're going to be able to f see farther and farther out there. But, um, yeah. And I think, too, like, well, like right now, even our information on Sedna is pretty fuzzy. You guys saw the chart. There were a lot, it was more estimated. Like its diameter is 1,000, you know, um, 1,000 uh, miles across. It's, it takes 11,000 years or so to, to, you know, to orbit the sun. So, yeah, so I think you know, we, we see it, but it's so far, I think it's just barely, maybe barely, um, you know, detectable as far as getting information on it. So hopefully that will change, though, with, yeah. with James Webb. It goes to show that our perspective on the solar system, it does ebb and flow, it changes, uh, and how we see it, uh, what, what's, what's actually out there in the Kuiper Belt and beyond. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question there. Well, the, the, dwar the dwarf. Well, the difference was um, that the, with the dwarf planet had the one thing that was different than the planet is that planets can clear the area of all the other debris. In other words, uh, not debris. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, clear their their orbits of other material. So, like you know, Jupiter and Saturn and Earth and so forth. We don't have a lot of stuff around us because we have 
you know, our gravity pulls it in. And these other dwarf planets are just not powerful enough to do that. And that's the deciding factor between a dwarf planet and uh, pretty much, and, you know, so. And there's other, you know, again, the orbits too, that was considered, but that, w that was the one factor that was different than a regular planet. I should say too, uh, interesting, when I'm reading about this stuff, that even in the 1950s, they, they had actually discovered, one, one of them is called Varuna. We didn't get to it because it's not a dwarf planet. It's maybe a candidate, but uh, they, they found some uh, uh, fo footage, you know, like a, a sequence of photos that showed this one object that is today called Varuna. But if somebody had noticed it, they might have had something else uh, after Pluto. So um, it's, very, it's hard stuff to actually sit there and look at all these dots and to see if they did one move, you know, and so forth from the night before. Question? Um, as far as well, the dwarf planets, d definitely not. Um, you know, Jupiter is so powerful that Jupiter's magnetic field actually influences us. I know, um, like if AM radio, um, you know, I guess, you know, especially like in your car back in the day, you hear that whiny noise, and so we hear these strange noises, and that was actually Jupiter's magnetic field um, interfering with your radio <laughs> reception. So. Um, We'll have to, uh, you have to read up on that, yeah. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Is Sedna currently a candidate for dwarf planets around? Well, I guess it seems like they've agreed that it is. I mean, uh, there's, I guess, a number of you know, groups that I could just decide these things. So it seemed like there was, like, basically, the consensus, consensus is that there's nine dwarf planets <laughs> and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, candidates. So, and so Sedna is in the new one, which is called Detached. <laughs> and, uh, and then you, they named those other ones out there Sednoids. Now, so far, the other ones they've, they've found, they believe, are sm you know, smaller than Sedna. But again, they might find other ones. And who knows where they are in their orbits. There could be a, a big one. You know? and, they, and they see uh, that some of the dwarf planets might have some, you know, influence a little bit on uh, maybe like Neptune's orbit, but probably not. And that's why there's a big hunt for a planet X still. So. What causes rings around planets? Rings are when um, like the moons and so forth collide, or maybe asteroids, but the moon, moons collide, or they maybe even crash into the planet, and it actually leaves this beautiful ring thing. And that's going to happen... Um, you know, it's already happened, of course, on Saturn. We have the beautiful rings there. But Mars is moon Phobos. I, I want to say something like 60,000 or some odd miles from Mars itself. And it's not a big moon. It's only like, you know, 13 or 17 miles across. But it's getting closer and closer to Mars. Now, it's still millions of years from happening. But it, wi it will hit Mars, and there will be ring, there'll be a ring around Mars. Um, also, Neptune's moon Triton, which is a giant moon, same thing. It's, it's relatively close to Neptune. It's getting closer all the time, so maybe like in a billion years, it'll leave a spectacular rings around, around Neptune. So, um, but yeah, good yeah. question, thanks. I, I have one last question from the live chat. Um, from Fred Kelly, they ask, does Pluto have a core? And uh, suggesting maybe, is it iron or, or something else? It is layered, you know. That's a g yeah, I believe there's like a metallic part to it. So, yeah, that's a, I'll have to research that. So, but thanks. Yeah. All right. That's all. All I have on the live chat. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Robert. If you want to stay here and chat with Robert some more, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it is starting to clear up. Uh, we're still kind of in twilight, so we're getting the telescope set up. If uh, some people want to make star finders like this, we have. Uh, that in our earth science room, all right? And the computer lab is also open for the uh, nighttime program called Stellarium, okay, which is kind of a digital version of this. But you can make your own star finder. And what this does is you can set it to the date and time, and you can see all the constellations that are out, okay? So right this way, if you want to do that, and the telescope will be open momentarily. So. All right, and those on the live stream, thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you.
on the next FNL and future observing streams. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, one suggestion. You had one slide that had red text on the line. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Sorry about I mean, that. Nobody can 